All right, good morning everybody, and welcome to the first uh, Tech Talk seminar, whatever, of uh, Flying Miata 2023. Thank you all for making it here. We've got people from all over the place um, visiting today. I know we have Germany at the very least. Uh, I don't know what other countries have, are represented, but thanks everyone for making the trip. We really appreciate it. It's, it's always good to see customers in the house. So thank you very much for showing up. My name's Keith Tanner. Oh, and for all the internet people, thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in as well. We, we like our internet people, there's a lot of them. Um, so my name is Keith Tanner. I'm one of the owners here at Fly Miata. Uh, we do a lot of live videos, as you may know, but once a week we do a live video talking about various aspects of the Miata, various products of the Miata. Um, it's been a lot of fun and we've actually had really good feedback from it and uh, hopefully it's been useful for you folks. I tend to do the theoretical side of things because that's what turns my crank and I've done a number of videos on aerodynamics. And so a lot of what I'm gonna talk about now, which is an aerodynamic seminar, um, you will find a deeper dive if you go to our YouTube channel. Um, you'll find things like the hood vents that we're looking at here. I did a whole thing just on hood vents, on uh, spitters and splats, as we call them, um, on the front, wings, that sort of thing. So if you want to go a little deeper into something, um, feel free to go to our YouTube channel, check out some of those deep dives. But today I'm gonna give an overview of aerodynamics because it's a place that, as much fun as it is to throw a bunch of money under the hood and get a big horsepower turbo or something like that, it's actually a place where you can almost get performance at a low cost. Now there's, there's some cost in the parts, but also there's not a lot of downsides to what you're doing because you're basically you're improving the efficiency of the car in a lot of ways. So it's a really fun place to play. And you can actually do a lot of this yourself. Um, there's a lot of DIY capability uh, in, in experimentation with aerodynamics. It's a lot of fun. So, the one thing you're going to hear me talking about, oh, and if you do have questions during this whole thing, put your hand up, you home, and you'll have to put questions in the comments. Um, but uh, yeah, put your hand up, feel free to ask questions. As you can see, I am flying without a net, I have no notes, I'm making this up as I go, so you can help drive the direction of the, of the conversation. So, the one thing you're going to hear me talking about quite a bit, and this is what I believe is the fundamental part of aerodynamics, is relative pressure. It's all about where is there high pressure on the car, where is there low pressure on the car, and air is going to try to go from low pressure to high pressure, and where you have a surface like a hood that's high pressure on one side, low pressure on the other, that's going to basically push on that panel, push on that part of the car, and that's where we get things like downforce. It's basically you have a high pressure area on one side, a low pressure area on the other, and that will push that area down or up if you've gone it wrong. Um, it, the, the way that vents work is you want the vents to sit where there is high pressure underneath, low pressure on top, and that will pull air through it. And that's basically what it comes down to. What are the relative pressures going on here? You're going to hear me go on about this a lot. There's another sort of fundamental thing of aerodynamics, and that's thinking about it. There's two ways to think about the air. One is you can think of the air as standing still, and a car moves through it. So you look at it from the point of view, say, of the air. Or you can look at it from the point of view of the car. Think of it as a wind tunnel where the car is still and the air is moving, um, moving across it. So it's sort of, you, again, you have to think of, uh, you, you flip back and forth. I don't know if I'll be talking about that too much in this, uh, in this seminar today, but it's always a good thing when you are looking at arrow, when you're thinking of arrow, is be able to, to think about you know, what just happens. There's a little air molecule sitting here and all of a sudden this car comes along and bludgeons it out of the way. Um, and does things to it, or you can look at it as the car is sitting here and air is rushing across. So, just a thing. So I'm gonna start at the front of the car here and talk about some of the parts around here. Um, some of them are intended to optimize cooling, some of them are intended to optimize grip, and some of them are intended to optimize drag. Grip or downforce, uh, which is really just lift turned upside down, so Aerodynamics often talk about lift coefficients. Really, when we're looking at downforce, we're looking at air lift coefficients, but since our airplanes are upside down, we're trying to push them into the ground. Um, lift versus drag is a big thing. In many cases, if you want to get downforce, you have to trade off some drag for it, which obviously means your, your car is working harder to push itself through the air. Sometimes you can get away with decreasing the drag while also increasing the downforce, which is the, the money for nothing kind of deal. And we'll talk about some ways to actually get that to happen. And it is perfectly acceptable when you are building a race car to trade those off, to trade off um, peak speed for downforce because the downforce gets you better cornering speed. 
And you'll see this in, in race groups like Formula One. Sometimes a car will be set up to be very high downforce. It'll be draggy, it'll be slow on the straight, but it's faster in the corners. It can brake later in the corners, so that's their strategy to get past other cars. Or you'll see someone to, uh, built to be very, very slippery at the expense of cornering speed, figuring they'll pass on the straights. So it's kind of a fun trade-off to be able to do. So let's go through parts. And I'll start at the front of the car because, eh, why not? So over here we have a car with a splitter. The splitter is this thing right here, and it does exact, I'll get into details on what this does in a moment, but effectively this splits the airflow. Half of it has to go up, the other half goes underneath. So we start with a splitter. You can also have an air dam up here, which is kind of what we have on Andy. Um, this is Andy, this is Roller Girl. Um, an air dam is basically blocks the air at the front of the car. It doesn't necessarily divert it on top or underneath, but it will block the air from, say, going underneath or going where you don't want it to go. Moving forward on this car, oh, we have some spats on this car, which is basically a blocking plate. Whoop, gotta watch out. Uh, blocking plate in front of the wheel to prevent the wheel from being the first, th the tire from being the first thing the air sees when it hits the car. And I'll get into why those are a bad idea. I did an entire um, seminar on these spitters and splats. Um, so there's lots of information on that. On this car, we also have a canard or a dive plane, um, which is a fairly crude device, but it's basically taking the air and pushing it up. And of course, as Newton told us, that means that the front of the car gets pushed down. So that's something you'll often see. This car's got hood vents on it, which is, I mean, it's designed to extract air from under the hood. This car does not have fender vents. We also have fender vents that on some of the vehicles. You'll see those as well. Um, there's some side skirts on this. That's designed to keep air from entering underneath the car. Um, if you have low pressure under the car, you don't want air squeezing underneath there. They also look very cool, which is the main reason you see them on a lot of cars. And here at the back, the obvious one, we have a wing. It's exactly the same concept as an airplane wing, except, like I said, our airplane's upside down, so it pushes down instead of up. And uh, these have end plates on them that, again, they keep, this is a low pressure area. They keep the high pressure air from curling underneath, and this helps make the wing a little more efficient. There's a spoiler here. This one is mostly for aerodramatics, as it's sometimes called. Um, <laughs> but uh, but a, a property done spoiler can prevent flow separation on the back and keep the air better. Or it basically manages the airflow because there's a big transition here. Your car's punching a big hole in the air, and it manages that, and it can also produce a little downforce. The crudest versions of them are the sort of thing you see on a lot of autocross cars because they're class limited. You see a great big plexiglass panel going up here. And that is a very crude spoiler, but it can be quite effective. Very draggy, but that's okay at autocross speeds. And then on the bottom of this car, we also have a diffuser. There's also flat panels underneath this car as well, um, which you can't see because it's difficult to turn over right now. But uh, there's also a diffuser on here, and that manages the way the air exits from underneath the car. So that's a rundown of the bits and pieces. You all good? There will be a test. So I hope, I hope you're taking notes. So we'll look at a couple of different aspects of this. The first thing we'll talk about is cooling, because that's the one that most of us need the most help with, especially you know, a track a day like we had yesterday. It's a warm day. Um, that's a relatively short track. The engines are working hard. It's actually hard to keep them cool, surprisingly. And that is all about moving air through your heat exchangers. Now, I like to say that air is lazy. It will always take the easiest way around something. When it comes to the front of this car, some of the air will go in the nose um, and go through whatever heat exchangers you have in there. But most of it will not, because what happens is it's effectively like, think of driving through snow. You end up with a big packed up pile of snow on the front of the car, and then the rest of it just kind of plows around the sides. And that's what's happening with air. It's piling up here, you've got high pressure, but eventually the new air that's coming in hits that high pressure and says, this is too much, I'm going around the side instead. And so you don't actually have as much air going through your radiators as you think you do. You think it's 70 miles an hour, there's 70 miles an hour worth of air going through there. There's not, it's more like 20. So the way you can improve that is you get rid of the high pressure. And the way to get rid of that is to make sure there's lots of low pressure at the back. Because once the air goes through the radiators, it gets in the engine bay, it's got nowhere to go. So that's the whole purpose of hood vents. These things effectively vacuum the air out from the uh, engine bay and create low pressure behind the radiator. That means the air has an easier time going through the radiator, out of here, and as a nice bonus, that gets you better cooling. But it also 
decreases the pressure on the top of your, or brain's going away. Um, it also helps uh, sort of get a little more front downforce, by the way, it manages the, uh, the airflow on top of here. So it actually helps glue the nose of the, the car down a little bit. But fundamentally, its purpose is to increase the airflow through the radiators. And if you look at purpose-built race cars, you'll see they'll often have enormous vents here just to encourage all of the airflow to go through the rads. And that's something, that's a place where a splitter can help a lot. Let's see if I can get over here without triggering the feedback. Um, when the air comes in here, it piles up on the front, some of it goes over the top, some of it goes around the side. A little bit of it goes through here, a bunch goes underneath the car. And that's not a place we, will, we want high pressure. Because again, we talk about the pressure pushing the car one way or the other. If we have high pressure under the car, that will lift the nose. And that's where you get instability at high speed, um, you get increased drag, but you also, I mean, basically the, the steering gets light. And for those of you with NAs, you know that the R package lip that's on, that's on the front, that's a proper air dam. That actually will decrease drag and keep the front more planted at speed. This is the extreme version of that. This forces the air to make a decision. It gets to here, by the time it's on top, it can't go underneath the car. So you have effectively split the airflow, thus the name. And this increases the flow through your radiators by, by basically forcing higher and higher pressure here. So again, our pressure differential, no matter how high the pressure is back this side, we increase it on this side, more flow through the radiator. All good. Any questions so far? From a cooling perspective, how much difference does it make if the splitter is that full panel that goes underneath the motor versus the one that's just more across the front of the car? All right, so the question is from a cooling perspective, how much difference does it make to have the full under tray, effectively? Um, everything from the splitter back. That's got to do with how the air sort of escapes from the engine bay. Um, it certainly makes a difference. We found when we started building turbo cars back in the day, we'd often leave those off because it was easier than dealing with cutting them for intercooler pipes, and the cars were more prone to have cooling problems. So you really do want to manage the airflow as much as you can. Um, I haven't done many studies on what happens if you just leave off the back half of it. So I don't know if I have a good answer for you right off the top of my head on that one. <laughs> you do, we know, certainly know from experience you want to have it there. Um, so on a similar note, uh, the, the side vents you see in a lot of cars, I know there's a few of them out there that have it, but these, these fender vents, they're designed to pull air out of a very ugly area right here. Um, wheels are incredibly messy aerodynamically because, well, they're spinning, really, kind of the job. But if you're going forward at 70 miles an hour, this is going the other direction at 70 miles an hour. Now you think of this poor little piece of air comes along here. The top is moving forward at 70 miles an hour, but the car is also moving through the air at 70 miles an hour, so this is actually moving forward at 120 compared to the airflow. So this is all sorts of chaos going on in here. Air gets in here, it gets thrown around. There's this vortex comes squirting out the side here. Um, they're just plain ugly. So you don't want to get, you don't want the airflow to meet the tire. And you want to do something as much as possible to get all the high pressure air out of there. Plus it's very hot air thanks to your brakes. So that's why we put vents back here and that's to help pull air through the wheel well. And that will also pull it out from underneath the hood as well. So that's another way of, uh, of sort of extracting the high pressure air from under hood. So that's where spats come in. I'm really jumping around here, I know that. Um, if you're getting confused, put your hand up and let me know. But uh, this is an overview. We do have more specific um, videos on each one of these. So again, we're talking about our messy tire. So I get away with it. So we've talked about at 70 miles an hour, the top of your tire is moving forward at 140 relative to the airflow. The front of it is going down at 70 miles an hour. And so that's why air comes around here, it hits that, gets slammed into the ground, squirts out the side, also it's a mess. And that's where these spats come in. These, these are sometimes given different names, but in our catalog they're called spats. And that's basically to keep the air from hitting the front of the tire. Uh, open wheel cars like Cater M7s, um, Formula One cars, they have all sorts of, like these are the messiest things on the cars aerodynamically, they're absolutely atrocious. So we want to shield them and shroud them as much as possible. So this is the sort of thing that can have quite an effect on um, on drag, effectively. So, okay, so let's get into the whole concept of downforce and drag. And that's, that's what we're looking to do. We want to, we want to make the car stick to the ground as much as possible, make it not draggy so that the engine doesn't have to work so hard or you get more speed for your horsepower. And one way to do that is, is to keep as, well, let me back up a little bit. When you're looking at relative pressures, you're looking usually at pounds per square inch. 
That's you know, how, how we, in the US we tend to measure pressure. Now think about that. If you can get a half inch, a half pound per square inch differential across a panel the size of a hood, that's a lot of square inches. That's a lot of weight pushing down in there. Even more if it's the entire surface of the car. So we want to get as little pressure under the car as possible. We want all that pressure to be on top because that will push it down into the ground. It will basically suck itself to the ground. And that's ground effect stuff if you're looking at race cars. So that's another purpose of the splitter, to minimize the amount of air that gets sucked under the car at the nose to sort of help vacuum it down a little bit. In some of our previous videos, we've talked about the actual numbers involved here. Um, a splitter like that will decrease drag as well as increasing downforce. So that's basically you're getting it for free there. That's a wonderful thing to have. And as a side effect, or not a side effect, another thing you can do is you can put a flat panel under the car, which basically makes sure that it's not tripping over things like um, exhaust systems, like transmissions, like all the stuff that hangs down there. It keeps it nice and smooth, so there's a nice smooth airflow underneath. And again, here we're thinking of the car being static and the air moving past it, but whatever. And then at the back, you can have what's called a diffuser, which is effectively, it's taking that air that's underneath and increasing, you know, it's stuck in an area this, this tall, and then it gradually increases it like this, and that makes it even lower pressure and helps pull the back end down a little bit more that's the purpose of a diffuser, and you'll see these on almost every race car. So this car is set up with a flat bottom. Um, it doesn't have a splitter on it right now, though we do put it on sometimes, and it's got this diffuser. So it's designed to use the entire bottom of the car as a suction cup to stick itself to the ground. And again, it's not a big difference in pressure, but it's enough that the number of square inches in here, it's a big push overall. Any questions? Yes? The question is, have we had any cooling problems with the flat bottom? And that is the downside, yes. Because your transmission is making heat, your exhaust is making heat, your rear end is making heat. And so that actually is a problem. We were experimenting. Um, the butterfly brace that we have, uh, the frame rails are actually designed to have mounting points for a flat bottom. And there's actually a prototype sitting over in the corner. We were testing that. Uh, Brandon, if you, if you um, capture Brandon and talk to him for a while, he's over in the corner. He's trapped. Um, <laughs> We did some instrumented testing on the effects that has, and it is definitely a concern on some vehicles um, because you're trapping that air in there. So we played around with some, uh, some submerged ducts. Most people know them as NACA or NACA ducts uh, on the bottom to pull some of that air and push it into the, the hot parts. Brandon can tell you how well that worked, but since you notice there is not a flat bottom kit in our, um, in our catalog for the NA and the NB, that might tell you a little bit about how it worked. Definitely something to take into consideration. What overall benefit and effect is all that arrow you put on that ND had on that car? So the question is what overall effect has all the arrow had uh, on this particular car? We have not done instrumented testing on every little piece of it, piece by piece in terms of lap times. Um, it would be more dramatic at a faster track than it is at our local track, but I can tell you that on my, on my Targa Miata, which is parked outside, it's got a, a wing that was actually originally built for a NASCAR, so it was optimized for speeds at 140 plus. Putting that on the back of that car and running at Grand Junction Motor Speedway, which has a maximum speed of 70 something and an average speed of just under 50, I took two seconds off my lap time. So it can have a fairly significant effect if done, if done well. So that car has never been on a high speed track? This car has been on a high speed track, but it was mostly investigating with other things like suspension. You know, we only have so much time to do documentation, so we're not necessarily when we're out there um, logging temperatures, for example, and, and logging uh, suspension changes, we don't have it wired up for aerodynamic stuff. And we're not going for lap times, so it's all a matter of what we're studying that particular day. This car is, of course, also a, uh, a showcase for a lot of our products. So, you know, if we have an ND aero part, it gets bolted to this one, <laughs> whether, we've, <laughs> whether we've documented whether, you know, it's the perfect match with this one or not. Yes? I was just going to ask, with all the additional downforce that my car gets when I sit in the driver's seat, <laughs> 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 so why doesn't the road hugging weight make you faster? Is that what you're saying? When you're sitting in the driver's seat, yeah. The problem is that, that weight also has to be pushed around corners. And that's where the aerodynamic downforce comes in handy. You don't have to, it doesn't have inertia. So you get that road hugging weight, the actual extra grip from there being more weight pushing the tire into the ground, but without it having to corner more weight. So that is unfortunately your downside, is you are having to move your weight around the corners and not just. Have you guys come up with a solution to that? <laughs> <laughs> the question for those at home is, have we come up with a solution for the, uh, the, the driver road-hugging weight? Um, yeah.
You're not going to want to hear it. Don't it involves a lot of running. <laughs> yeah, you can do it the usual way. You can, uh, you can, you know, lighter weight parts. You can just start taking parts off. You know, whatever works for you. But, I left my wife at home. <laughs> not going there. Okay, so the most obvious part of the downforce thing, of course, is the wing. And this is something that usually is the most obvious direct trade-off of drag versus downforce. Now, we did a video a while back on can you have downforce without drag that goes into some of the numbers on this one. My brain has, has purged most of the information I absorbed for that video, so I'm not going to necessarily duplicate all of it, but it's actually surprising with the right wing how little difference it can make. Um, wings have a lift to drag ratio. Uh, I mean, that's, airplanes live by this. The more lift or downforce it generates, generally speaking, you're going to trade off drag for that. There's a few tricks you can get away with that will let you get it, but the nice thing about a wing is by simply adjusting the angle within a certain range, you can dial up the amount of downforce you have, you can dial down the amount of downforce you have, and you can see on this, on this wing it's got multiple holes here on the, uh, you can't see it very well, you can multiple holes on the, on the wing mounts, and by simply adjusting which bolts the, you have that attached to, that will change the angle of the wing, and that will change the amount of downforce, that will change the amount of drag that this particular car is generating. And you can use this for fine-tuning um, your balance on the racetrack, for example. And it is the most overt thing. I mean, these things can generate hundreds of pounds of downforce if you crank them up, but they will also generate dozens of pounds of drag. Um, and so you can, you can fine-tune that depending on your track. If you put more lift, you want to, you want to use lift to offset the... <laughs> Just start a YouTube channel, this would be great. Um, one thing that generally you try to do with downforce is you try to set it up so that the aerodynamic, you know, the car at 80 miles an hour when it's got the downforce working on it, its, it's balance, its front to rear balance is about the same. So if your car has 50-50 weight distribution and you are booting along at 80 miles an hour and you're, you're forcing the car back into the ground, ideally you want 50% of your downforce be on the front, 50% on the back, so the balance is the same. Um, because what you don't really want is, you know, have a wing like this, crank up all the way, and you discover on high-speed corners you understeer like crazy because you've now super glued the back of the car to the ground and the front of the car is lifting up. I mean, honestly, it actually will lift the front of the car if you put enough here because it's got a, uh, got a, a fulcrum going on. I personally actually will often set my car up so that it oversteers at low speed. It's got, you know, it's, it's, hand, it's general handling balance is, is more for rotate at low speed and then a little more downforce in the back so it's more stable on high speeds. That's the way I like to set it up. It makes me feel more comfortable when I'm turning into a high speed corner that, you know, the back end is very well planted. And then on the slow speed corners, I can, I can rotate it around and dance it, as you might have noticed yesterday. Um, but the general rule on this thing is you take it, this is, your this is your most adjustable piece of downforce. Keep adding wing angle until your lap times plateau and well, plateau and then start to go up again because that'll give you the most grip in the corners. That's usually the general rule is just keep adding downforce until you get to the point where your, your loss of straight line speed does not, no longer overcomes your increase in, uh, in cornering speed. Am I making sense? Or have I had a stroke and I'm just kind of talking nonsense? But I never know. I've got a live audience at least today. That's much better than talking to Travis's camera all the time. Uh, we had a question back there. So the question is basically, are you, are you increasing the wear on the rear suspension by putting more weight back here? Yeah. Um, honestly, I mean, if you're putting a, a huge subwoofer in the trunk, that's another consideration that same way. I mean, it's effectively the same concept. There is more weight. You may have to adjust your spring rates. I mean, that is quite possible. If you're generating significant downforce, you might have to run significantly more spring rate because the car is going to be riding lower. You've got to support it. Um, I forget the name of the guys that were doing this. There, there's, there was a company that was doing sort of a private, uh, a private um, optimization program they were doing, and they have pictures of the car going down the straight versus its standard ride height, and you can see it's pulled down by about an inch or so, simply by aero. Um, fantastic stuff. And yeah, for, if you're going to be running big aero, you need big springs. So it's not so much a wear thing, because the suspension is intended to move, but you might find yourself, you know, in extreme cases, you could find yourself on the bump stops more, for example. You might have to tune for that downforce. Um, which is a great problem to have if you can, uh, if you can manage it. I, in my own car, I don't generally have to 
go quite that far because I'm not generating enormous amounts of downforce, but it certainly is a real thing. I know the, the super meata guys, when they, are, when they are really cranking around, they, uh, they run some very high spring rates trying to get their stuff working because they've, uh, they've really optimized the NV uh, body in particular. Uh, yes? The wind blocker. Okay, so the question is effectively the effect of an open cockpit is more or less yeah. what you're looking at. Um, you know, is there any way to sort of decrease the buffeting? Uh, and in the old NA and NB tricks uh, is put the passenger's window up. And that will actually smooth out the airflow for the driver. Don't tell your passenger this, but it makes it much worse for the passenger. Um, you tell it's for them. You know, you tell them oh, it'll, it'll make things a little bit better. But, uh, but yeah, that actually will have an effect. And actually, on an NA, it's kind of fun. You can really feel the difference even by popping the headlights. You can feel that the disruption of the airflow comes over the windshield. Um, so the question is, how can you improve it? It's not an easy thing to improve, unfortunately. Um, it's an open-top car, and open-top cars, by their nature, are just plain ugly aerodynamically. Because what happens, I'll sneak around behind this car. The air is coming along here, comes over the hood. It actually has, you have a little bow wave. It comes over the top, and that's our low pressure area, which is what drives our hood vents. Um, so very little air goes, goes, stays attached. It goes over the top. A lot of it goes this way, but there's a big high pressure zone at the, at the base of the windshield, and then it ricochets off the windshield and hits this and just goes nuts. You know, it just rotates all over the place. There's all sorts of uh, chaotic air, and chaotic airflow is slow air. It's, you know, aerodynamic ugly. And yeah, there's really not much you can do to improve that. I mean, you could try running a bikini top. That's something that will help the airflow. I know there's at least one car here with a bikini top. I saw it on the track yesterday. Um, and that can help smooth the airflow over the top and get rid of some of that buffeting. Um, I can also tell you from my experience with my, my Lotus 7 replica that if you take the windshield off, that will help a lot. Um, because that will give you nice linear air right through there uh, instead of the chaos. It's a little harder to do on these cars. Uh, well, it's quick to do. It's hard to put back on. but. Um, <laughs> It is an option. I'm not going to say it's not there. Uh, but the best option may be the bikini top to get rid of some of that buffeting. Hopefully, is, is the driver of the bikini top, top car here? I know, I know there was someone. Oh, there we go. He's been outed. All right. Um, can you comment? Does it, does it decrease the buffeting on the car um, at speed when that's on there? Yeah, it's not that on the first, especially if you put up the windows. Okay. So <laughs> the answer is... Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a, it's a little bit better. I mean, that's all you can ask for with a convertible. That's kind of the fun, isn't it? It's just having the, the wind in your hair, uh, the bugs in your teeth, that kind of thing. But yeah, it, there's only so much we can do. The little wind blocker that you referenced, for those who don't know them, is missing on this car. It's just a little, um, a little dam that goes back here that keeps the air from rotating around and coming forward. Uh, in cold weather, you might notice it being up and down a little bit more. And to let you know, the first aftermarket product I ever made and built was a wind blocker. It was, a, it was an acrylic Lexan, whatever, that's uh, polycarbonate, um, plate basically that, that was about the size of this airbag or this uh, roll bar strapped to the back of the seats here and then, um, and then kept the air from going around. It actually worked quite nicely because I used to drive that in freezing temperatures, close to freezing temperatures across Ontario in the wintertime. I was young, I was stupid, um, <laughs> but it actually did work quite nicely. And my mother still uses one to keep the squirrels out of her garden, so. Uh, we had a couple hands, yes? The question is, should we keep the top up on the track? And the answer is for aerodynamic purposes, yes. And a hard top is even better. And some of the time trial guys are using just sort of half hard tops because you get flow separation at the back of the hard top, things get a little bit ugly. Um, there's games you can play with that. The fast back conversions are really the best choice because it's a nice smooth transition. Air is draggy where it separates from the car. So basically where it's got a nice smooth place to go, there's no problem. Once, you get, once it separates, you start getting turbulence and that will sort of suck on the car and cause, uh, cause drag. So you want to avoid that as much as possible. So the back of a hard top, you do get separation. Now back in the day when we built the Track Dog race car in 2002, we actually had slots in the back window to feed a little bit of high pressure air in there to effectively make a fast back out of it. it was, we had a lot of fun with that car. Um, but yes, um, basically, 
the more tops you can have on the Miata, and the, the less flexible that top, the less drag you'll have. Uh, I'm going to go for the one on the back. So the question is basically the effect of the roll bar on the rear wing, and is there any aerodynamic effort put into the roll bars to make them worth with the ring, the wing? And the answer is effectively no, um, because a roll bar has one paramount purpose, and that is to protect the driver as much as possible. And compromising the roll bar in any way to affect aerodynamics is basically just not how it's done. Um, you could use, I mean, if you wanted to make it better, you could put a little um, teardrop extension on the back so that it's less, because tubes are draggy, tubes are not good. The front half is okay, but the back half, the, the separation is terrible. So putting a little airfoil shape on the back would be an interesting thing to try. Actually, that'd be kind of fun. Um, I suspect that a roll bar probably doesn't have a lot of effect on aero because on a top-down car, there's a chaos going on back here anyway. Um, but it would be a very interesting thing to experiment with. That, that would be kind of fun um, because you really don't want turbulent air hitting the wing because the entire purpose of the wing is the air has to go further underneath here than it does here. Thanks to our friend Bernoulli, we know that that means low pressure here high pressure here, and that's what pushes the wing down. If the, wing, if the air gets here all turbulent, the, the wing doesn't work as well. So, yeah, that would be a really fun thing to play with, actually. That would be fun. Yes? So, earlier there was a question on how much having the roof down affects the aerodynamics of the car. I was just uh, curious how, like, how bad that effect is versus having it up versus down. So, the question is how, how bad is the effect of the roof up versus roof down? I don't know of any specific CFD um, tests that have been with that, and I don't I can't remember if Mazda ever released drag coefficient things. I suspect they do. The Yamaguchi books may have drag numbers in them. There's probably someone on the internet right now typing very quickly, telling us what it is. But uh, I mean, you can see it easily enough yourself. Go on an interstate drive. Um, put the top up, drive a distance. Put the top down, drive a distance. What happened to your fuel economy? Right. We all know it gets worse with the top down, and that's 100% due to drag. So yeah, right there, you can just see the effect. Your engine's working harder to do the same work. That means that you're, you're draggy. So, yeah, I mean, hard tops, we all know that you get better fuel economy on the, on the uh, highway with the hard top, and that's the exact same thing as slippery. Yes? So the adjustability on the wing and whatnot is, is pretty clear. Like, you can play with that, and it's, e it's easy to change out. What about trying to keep that balanced in the front? What variables and things can you fiddle with there to try and achieve that 50-50 balance? So the question is, is basically, um, what can you do with the front to balance the rear? And because the rear is the easy one. Yeah, you just crank it up and there's all that downforce. Um, so when I'm doing it, generally, I concentrate on getting as much front as I can, and then I match it to the rear. So ways you can increase the, uh, the amount of front downforce, um, short of like, by adjusting things as opposed to just doing more things, you know, adding on hood vents, adding on splitters and stuff like that. Um, one you can do is you can, you can adjust the length of the splitter. The longer a splitter is, effectively, the more, the more effective it is at keeping air from getting underneath. Because what happens is eventually the high pressure zone sort of comes here and air starts folding underneath. The longer the splitter, the, uh, the better that works. And you've seen those pictures of the cars from Japan with splitters coming down here. Yeah. Um, I mean, if it can done well, it can be, as my roommate used to say, if it can be done, it can be done to excess. So, or if it's worth doing, it's worth doing to excess. Yeah, he lived by that. Um, so you can adjust that. This is, obviously, there are some practical considerations. <laughs> At some point, you, know, you get to the point where you can't hit a bump. There's also often classing regulations as well. You can't, you're not allowed to go any further on this. So that's, but that is one thing you can use for adjustment. You can also angle this slightly as well. These are adjustable. So you could tilt it down slightly more, and it becomes sort of a crude um, you know, plane. It becomes almost like a, uh, a wedge. You know? you've, you've stuck your hand out the window and gone like this, and you know, you know how that works. So that is one thing to do. Another thing you can do is canards. Um, they're a little crude. Uh, they're kind of the, the blunt instrument. I use them on the target car when it's in full aero mode because that thing is a blunt instrument. Um, I've got horsepower to burn, so I'm not worried about a little bit of drag. But changing the angle on these things is a way to dial up and dial down the downforce. Unfortunately, at a fairly high drag um, cost, generally speaking. But on my car, if you go to the, the splitters and spats uh, video I did a while back, I, can, I actually show the parts I made for my car. But it started off as a, as, a, as a 90 degree shelf like this, and then I built a canard that went on like that, just a ramp, and it made a significant difference in front, front grip, front downforce. So that's something you can do there. You can actually even play with the rake of the car a little bit. 
because the bottom of your car, if you rake it down at the nose, lift the back up, you're increasing the gap in the, uh, underneath the car. And again, Bernoulli, that's going to decrease the pressure underneath, and that acts as a crude wing. Uh, if you look at the Formula One cars from a couple of years back, um, before Red Bull started winning everything, um, <laughs> the, uh, the Mercedes cars were a high rake car. You can see them. They're, they're actually angled down quite a bit. All the others were running fairly flat. So you can visibly see on that case the effect. They were getting much more downforce out of their uh, underbody because of that. I don't know why nobody else ever started doing that, but I think Red Bull picked up on it <laughs> eventually. Uh, anything else? Yes? So what effect on cooling and aerodynamics do any extra vents in the front of the car, like turn signal intakes and maybe um, NA's intakes on the headlight? Like so the question is what effects do basically putting more holes in the nose of the car have on cooling? <laughs> <laughs> um, they can help up to a certain point. Um, you mentioned the turn signal intakes. That's actually detrimental to cooling because that's forcing more air under hood behind the radiators. So that's, you know, that's decreasing our relative pressure. There's actually less pulling the radiator. They're the exact opposite of a hood vent in that regard. They're great if you have an intake behind there because you can force cold air into the intake. So there's a power increase. That's what they're really good at. But uh, unfortunately for cooling, they're actually backwards. And on the target Miata, again, I keep talking about that thing. Um, but we took it to the target, I think, in 2011. I had an air intake on one side because that's where the, uh, the intake was. And it was boxed in. Or sorry, we did this on the, on the track dog back in 2002. Um, we had a NACA duct or an NACA duct on the headlight lid forcing directly into a box that had the, um, that had the intake. And the idea there was cold air to the intake, but try to keep the air from force feeding high pressure air under hood. In terms of the front of the car, you have to be able to get the air out. So yes, you can certainly, if you put a hole in a high pressure area, you're gonna push more air through there. It's certainly definitely going to help as long as that air is forced to go through your heat exchangers or through your brake ducts, for example. Um, yeah, this one's, this one's got an, an extra vent where the uh, daytime running lights used to be. It's a high pressure area and it's an intake for a brake duct hose because that's nice high pressure, feeds nice cold air to the brakes, and it's a great place to put it. Um, but you, again, you have to make sure it goes through the heat exchangers. So just having holes in the front of the car doesn't help unless it's directed. And that's another trick to actually making sure your cooling works properly is make sure there's no places where the air can get past the radiator. People pay a lot of attention to that. Um, but I've always been of the opinion that decreasing the, the pressure behind the radiator is much more effective, generally speaking, because that's, it's weaker there. It's much easier to get big air in the front. It's, it's much harder to get air out from under, under hood. Does that help at all? Yes. Back to top up, top down. <laughs> when you're on a track, you have to have the windows down. <laughs> so you have to have your windows down. So do you have you done any studies to see how windows down and up affect air? So the question is basically the effects of windows up versus windows down in terms of drag. Uh, because on the track, you're usually required to have the windows down, and that's a safety reason. I mean, there's, there's safety rules for that, and unfortunately, because it's a safety rule, well, that's what you're going to have to do. <laughs> Aerodynamically, it's much cleaner with the, with the windows up, and you can feel that with the buffeting, and again, you can always, drag is such an easy thing, you can either do a coast down test, which you take, you know, take a set of ro a road that you know that's sort of, take it consistent, get up to a certain speed, and then measure how long it takes to get down to another speed and then change something, and then do the same run again. If you control your variables well, that's a good indicator of drag. Um, it is definitely going to be drag gear with the windows down. There's not much you can do about that. You might be able to do something. Again, I'm going back to catering. Um, they have sort of little wings they'll put on here sometimes to sort of force more air to go around the cockpit instead of curling around here. Exactly what effect that has on drag, I'm not 100% sure, but it'd be a fun thing to play with. Have you done any uh, things with turbulator tape? So the question, have we done anything with turbulator tape? Vortex generator, that kind of thing? Yeah. I have a set of vortex generators that are sold to small airplane pilots. They're not the ones that you see on, on Evo, whatever they were, they put them on the roof. Um, but little things to yeah, add a little bit of turbulence, push a little energy into the airflow. I have not had the chance to experiment with them yet. Okay. Just curious, because I've seen cars with them on the uh, vent class pillows, or on the A pillows. Yeah, it's possible you could put some of that along there, and it effectively forms a, a non-physical barrier for the, for, the, uh, for the air, effectively. You can sometimes use turbulence as a, as a curtain, 
Um, you'll sometimes see that coming off the, uh, the Formula One cars again, use this a lot. They'll take the vortices that are coming off the wheels and that kind of thing and use them as effectively a, a wall. And I suspect that's what's going on there. It would be interesting to play with. I have not done it myself. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, then we've covered everything there is to know about aerodynamics. Um, <laughs> feel free if this is, hopefully this has been just an overview. It's giving you some ideas. I could talk about this thing I'm leaning on here a little bit, couldn't I? Um, the end, uh, one, two more things about, about wings then. There's two things you can do to sort of cheat with wings and get more downforce without a drag penalty. One is the size of the end plates. If you look at on eBay, you look at all the, all the plastic fantastic wings that are out there um, that were generated by whatever looked cool, they tend to have very small end plates. And the problem is you've got high pressure here, as you want, low pressure here, as you want, and then it wants to go around the end and just spoil this. So the more the high pressure leaks in at the end of the wing, you get the high pressure under the wing, that part of the wing basically stops working. So this is the purpose of the end plate, and that's just a barrier, it's literally a barrier to keep the high pressure from getting into the low pressure area. And so you can go with a bigger, a bigger end plate. I think nine, live, nine Lives Racing sells a number of different sizes of these things. I have some comical ones available for my car. Um, <laughs> But it works. The other thing you can do is you can do what's called a wicker bill or a gurney flap, um, depending how old you are. Uh, and it is basically a little fence that goes along here, just a little. I mean, I think I use Home Depot 90 degree aluminum stuff that's about, three, about half an inch high, but just a little shelf that comes along here. And it basically just, it's a spoiler for the wing. It generates a little bit of low pressure right behind it, helps drive the wing, a um, little, little less pressure underneath here, and it's actually very low drag. So that's a way you can cheat. And you can, you can actually fine tune a wing by simply sliding them in here. These wings are made with a little channel. You take off the end of this, you just slide in the wicker bill. I believe we sell those as well for these, for these wings. And, uh, and that allows you to fine tune things. All sorts of tricks you can do with these. They're kind of fun. So yeah, I promised I was done. So there you go. Um, if you have any more questions, I will uh, you know, come, come chat with me. I will happily talk your ear off about this stuff. Uh, we also have those YouTube videos where you can have pre-recorded copies of me uh, talking your ear off. Um, and walking around and gesticulating at things. So I welcome you to go check out our YouTube channel. There's a lot of really good information on there. And if you have suggestions for topics you want us to cover, things that you don't think we've talked about, um, such as turbulators for the, uh, for the A-pillar, throw them at us. Uh, we're always looking for new content. So, uh, What is the next, uh, next seminar, Kyle? 11. What is it about? Oh, it's uh, indexing. indexing bushings. Indexing okay. Yeah, so 15-minute break. You can all go mingle in the lobby. Um, we, will, uh, we will have, I think it's Nick and, Nick and Matt are going to talk about indexing bushings. So if you got this was arcane, just wait till you check that out. Thanks for your attention, folks. We'll see you soon.